Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Nancy Tilton Hand. She is an author, trainer, and coach specializing in the fine art of communication, and she is our guest today. She helps high achievers build and rebuild strong, meaningful relationships and supportive social professional networks. I know how good she is at this because after just two short conversations, she helped me turn my team challenges around. She's also the author of Beyond Rainmaking and the Hands-On Plan. Her latest project, the Friends on Hand podcast, explores the fabric of friendship and what it takes to craft strong, genuine social... <laughs> Social connections, sorry, my, I got tongue-tied there. Strong, genuine social connections in a world of digital disconnect. And aren't we all feeling that now? Mm-hmm. Nancy lives in Memphis, Tennessee with her husband and two terriers. She is a master sourdough baker, a longtime photographer, and an avid dahlia grower. Did I say that word, dahlia? Is that, yeah. what's Dahlia, Nancy? They're the most beautiful flowers on the planet ever. Wait, you, when you, when you go search them, mm. search photos of Dahlias, they are so cool. Um, and they range in size and color and shape. The only thing you can't get is a blue Dahlia, I think, but I have some, I've had some that are like eight inches, nine inches across. And I, you know, they come in little pom-poms sometimes. They're really neat. Oh, I'm going to have to look them up. That sounds awesome. You're going to go down a rabbit hole. (laughs) (laughs) So you, you are, you do so much. You have so many interests and I've had the pleasure of talking with you a couple of times and your personality is just amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you and I just realized that I probably don't know your backstory and your journey to where you are today and what made you who you are and the (laughs) amazing businesswoman that you are. So could you tell us a little bit about that? I can. And, and you kind of, I, I wasn't really sure what we we're talking about today. And you, you laid that on me. And I will say this is something I am learning to do. So I'm learning to tell my story right now. And it's, wow. it's it, I, I'm just going to roll with it. Um, I am cool. A, Go. I, I'm the product of a narcissistic alcoholic um, litigation attorney and, and my mother was basically the love child of Merlin and Martha Stewart. And she, <laughs> I'm not kidding. She, she blazed a trail, wow. was, was a new age alternative pioneer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She had a PhD in food science and nutrition. She was as square as they make them. She didn't drink, she didn't smoke. And she Kyle Omega tennis team and all of that. But she, in 1973, um, when I swallowed six cents, um, had had to, she said she put on her dark glasses and her trench coat and went down to the um, health food store, but just to, to get some seaweed so that I would eat something. Um, covered with chocolate, I did eat that and all was well. Um, but that led her into a journey of learning more about energy and alternative things. And she was very curious and very scientific about her, her interests. And what she ended up doing was uh, she would learn something, try it, work with her, and she worked with individual clients to rebuild um, rebuild people after extreme medical interventions. So she was a go-to for the doctors in the area when someone had gone through chemo or something like that, and they were successfully out the other side, but all of that does a number on your body. So getting them back into right. a balance nutritionally and um, basically with their minerals and things like that. So she, she was sometimes the last hope for people, but through that, she learned acupressure and reflexology, which she taught at Louisiana State University as a like leisure classes. But I'm cutting to the chase. She was a freaking master of so many things. And she, for us, for my brother and sister and I would, if something was worth knowing and she tried it and tested it and found it to be useful, she would teach us. 
And so from, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I have been steeped in the woo. If you want to know, <laughs> like, like <laughs> it doesn't work. And I, it's made me kind of a cynic because I'm like, you know, when, when there, there are some woo woo people and some new agers out there and they would never guess it of me, partly because I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> Cause I've been, yeah, there. you're very professional. You're, you're really fun, but you're also very professional. Well, I've, I have, we, from the time I was three to the time I was 16, every Tuesday night, we would go to this salon and there were people from NASA and scientists and just talking about energy and, um, the different, different books. They would discuss books like the Seth books and things like that. And just talk, talk about these things, energies and auras and, you know, foresight and things like that. So anyway, that is so interesting. (laughs) You had a, you had a really interesting childhood. Yes, it was. Flip side was dad that basically I had, I had somebody telling me that I was, that I was dumb and fat and everything else. And then I had someone else and a whole group of other people going, you are a star child. And so um, when I was about 14, my parents started going through a divorce. And when I was 15, my sister and mother and I went on a trip to rural Canada to see, uh, basically to have like a salon, just to talk to people about these same things. And um, at the end of that weekend, I cracked my skull in a horseback riding accident. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, you wanted the story. <laughs> hey, I'm so, this is huge, this is amazing. <laughs> So, um, I, it was, it was weird. It just, um, I was on an empty stomach. I mean, so many things came into play there, but I've been riding horses since I was a kid and, you know, bravo bravado. And do you want to ride with me? So we swapped horses at the end of our trail ride and her horse just like, poof, and it was, it was done. Um, and we were so far out of a range of a city that we ended up in this tiny little bitty place called Port Perry. Shout out to Port Perry because I'm still here. Um, <laughs> and I was I was officially over the bridge for 71 seconds. And oh, wow. then um, it was it was just a small, it was like a vet clinic small place. I think it's gotten bigger now, but not much. They have a helipad now, and I know why, because when they had to airlift me out, there was nowhere for anybody to go. So the locals came and they circled their cars. This always kind of makes me cry, so bear with me. The locals circled their cars so that the helicopter could land in a field by the hospital. Oh my gosh. Wow. And I woke up seven days later in ICU and um, they had, they did not expect me to live the first 40, 48 hours. And my mother wow. and another really cool lady named Donna who showed up out of the blue with her two daughters basically shamaned over me for 48 hours straight. And, um, but from that, I, a couple of things happened. One, it was a head injury and nobody could see it. And this was 1985 and nobody knew Jack Diddle about head injuries then. Right. Like we didn't start to wrap around the whole head injury, closed head injury. This was an open head injury. Um, until the nineties for the first Gulf war was when we started to actually get some information about that, but nobody knew. Um, I lost my sense of smell. I went from just a high achieving kid to wildly dyslexic. I couldn't tell you the months, the year in order. I couldn't tell time on a clock. Um, I I was adding and subtracting backwards and that wasn't caught until I was in college. (laughs) Um, Oh my gosh. I was right sometimes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like you can do it. You can do it backwards and sometimes nail it still. So um, that slipped under the radar. But when I got home, um, you know, they, they didn't shave my head. I had a bald spot and a scar that I was 15 and I wanted nobody to think of me as different. Like if you couldn't see that something was wrong and I wasn't going to own up to it. And for reasons I now understand better, mom didn't want anybody to know how bad it had been because dad would have taken me away. And so mm, yeah, this, like, I never it wasn't until two years ago when I reconnected with Donna, who was there in the hospital that I, that the, you know, I'm still processing through that part. I realized how big of a deal it was because it was downplayed, 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 downplayed for a lot of great reasons. But because it was me, the achiever that I am, which is, I know how I connect with achievers. I was like, what's wrong with me that I can't do X, Y, Z. Why am I, why do I need to sleep 15 hours? Um, 
my dad thought I was on drugs and he terrorized us. Um, oh my gosh. Nobody understood what had happened. And so um, it got so bad at one point, I finally said, I, I don't, I don't want to live under this threat. And I begged my mother to let me quit school. So her condition was that I take NLP and which is neuro-linguistic program. It's the study of how your brain processes and retrieves information. And my sister and she and my sister had gone through it when I was um, like, right when we got back. So that year I was with them all the time. So I kind of was a fly on the wall for a 20, I think it was a 21 day total NLP practitioner program. And then when I said, I was like, I gotta quit. I was 16. And that was her condition. And I had to take my a GED and get my California achievement thing um, certification, which I did. And I started college and <laughs> I out myself a thousand times over, but between 1986 and um, 1992, I tried college 13 times. I had 11 wow. different jobs. I have I had 11 different jobs. And when I wow. tell you I've had some jobs, I've done everything from hostess at Orion's, Orion's family steakhouse to selling Jeeps to uh, I ran a foaling barn for an Arabian horse um, breeder. I ran um, all the greenhouses for a landscaping company and a major like grower. Um, I sold luggage. I was an assistant manager at a wild pair shoe store. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> name it. I've done it <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. And then so, uh, but all during that period, I was relearning how to learn. And of course I learned NLP, I learned how to meditate. I learned um, uh, things called the, the brain gym exercises, which are designed to rewire your brain. And when you're 15 and you wanna be cool, the last thing you wanna be doing is learning how to crawl like a baby again, but I did it. And um, a lot of massage, and I will tell anybody out there, if you have a head injury or, or some kind of a trauma, physical trauma, car wreck or anything, I think one of the very, very best things you can do is massage or just, just the tactile skin on skin. I think it is really one of the most powerful healing tools we have. Um, and so when I was 22, I was watching my friends begin to go to school and some of them were going on an, on an abroad. Oh, I skipped a bunch of stuff. I did, I went to, a, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. In that, in that span of time, when I was doing all two of the coolest things uh -huh. I did during that time, one was when I was 17, I went and lived in Lausanne, Switzerland on my own for eight months. <laughs> to learn. Oh, wow. And I went to a, you were very, you were a big risk taker. Yes. Well, I felt invincible. I did. And, wow. when, and what I want to sort of make clear here is the through line in my life. I had a combative dad. I had, you know, kind of one of my siblings took after him. It, it has been about coming to agreement and understanding and learning how to learning how to reach an accord and friends have at every step of this way really been helpful to me. And when I couldn't compute anymore, when I couldn't do academic anymore, when I, when I was struggling with that, I, my EQ went through the roof. You know, you lose one sense, another one can, comes in. And that's what happened with me. And I, I have friends from first grade on, I've managed to just create these extraordinary bonds with people. And wow, they have, I have, Donna did save my life that time. I have two other friends who have saved my life at different points. Um, one, wow. One, <laughs> One, I was choking on a maraschino cherry in a bar in college, and my best friend gave me the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> wow. And, and I, I fell out of a raft in a class five rapid, and another friend later on fished me out. So twice. And those are friends wow. I made when I was 14. So um, where was I? Okay, I uh, went back to college. Here's the thing. I took something called photo reading, which is a way of... Um, reading with your implicit peripheral vision, basically. It's a totally different take on that. And my friends were going back to school. They were going to do a semester abroad and I wanted to get my butt back to Europe because I loved it and I still do. And um, I took everything that I'd learned and I, I went to a smaller school. So it was a commute, smaller school called Southeastern Louisiana University. And I commuted 40 minutes to and from school 
and I couldn't keep a job like that was those hours were, were impossible to handle. And my um, older sister is a jeweler. And out of the blue, somebody, the woman who had been doing the pearls for ever in Baton Rouge quit. She like, she had unfinished stuff. She returned it all the jewelry stores. She and her husband bought motorbikes and they, they retired and they went to ride motorbikes on uh -huh. the Blue Ridge Parkway. And uh, she said, go get her business, go get her. She was a famous recluse. She like renowned for not being very friendly. And I called her and called her and called her and called her and called her, called her. nothing. And then finally, I just went to her house. I was like, she's, who are you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm Austin's little sister. I want to, I want you to <laughs> teach me how to do what you were doing. And she's like, I'm not going to teach you, but I'll sell you my stuff. And so she sold me all of her pearl stringing equipment, recommended a video and sent me on my way. I bought it all for 80 bucks. And this was, this was really how wow. I started, how I started my first real business. So um, uh -huh. at this point I was 21. Um, almost 22 and I made these so <laughs> oh they're so cute I fun um, I don't have a strand on but from that I learned how to string pearls like a boss and I became the pearl lady of Baton Rouge for the entirety of my undergraduate school I um, that's how I that's how I paid for school I was stringing wow, pearls that's awesome and going to school and uh, it's it, I mean at one point uh, they were sending me home. One jeweler, um, I'll call it out, Lee Michaels, sent me home with a 40 inch strand of 10 millimeter. That's a big old pearl right there. 10 millimeter Mickey Moto pearls with a pave diamond clasp. <laughs> and I got to the end of that sucker. It was 44 inches. I got to the end of that sucker and the silk broke. And <gasps> I had, I had a wad I had a wad of pearls and I was like this, so mad. Uh. I, I was in the middle of midterms and I was like, no. And wow. my mom walked in and she's like, stop. Because <laughs> <laughs> no. that's starting all over again. So, um, and I, I really just, I knocked it out. Everything that I learned between age 16 and 22 was was what I needed to get through undergrad. And I blew through complete four-year undergrad in three years. Um, I, I pushed my math off. I had I'd taken the ACT twice and, and on both. And I had, my collective was like a 24 on both exams, but my math score was a four and a five respectively. I don't know if you know those scores, but 24 is a high don't. score. Four and five is just about as low as you can get on those. And so oh, wow. I had been pushing off a remedial math. I pushed off all of the math. And then I decided I wanted to go to law school. And I needed to somehow get, I, this, is, this is how my brain sometimes works. I went and did my research and found out that the law school I wanted to go to would allow me to dovetail my last semester of electives with my first semester of law school. And I went and I talked to my advisor and she laughed and laughed and laughed because you, you could only start law school in the fall. And she said, there's no way you would have to, I'm like, yes. So you would have to <laughs> retake your ACT, test a 19 or better on the math section that you got a five on last time. Then that would put you in, we could put you in an, like an algebra course. And then um, the next, the next one, because I had to have three maths. Then the next semester, you could do the algebra two plus a statistics. And if you can get through that, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> and she, <laughs> so I, she didn't know you very well. I went and I took my, my LSAT one weekend and the following weekend went and sat for the ACT again. And I made a 20 on the math section. <gasps> Whoa, way <laughs> so to go. Ended up in a math class that was like, cause I'd never had math at that level. Right. I, I was out when I was 16. Yeah. Like the, the yeah. extent of my math was what ninth grade, maybe at that yeah. point. <laughs> Like you right. know, calculus, I'm like, nope. You ever had geometry? Nope. <laughs> you ever had chemistry? Mm -mm. No. Um, so, so, but I did it. And, and that was, I piled on so much work the two semesters before law school that when I got into my first year of law school, my first semester of law school, where everybody's supposed to be freaking out. I was like, yeah, I'm getting a job. <laughs> so <laughs> I kept stringing the pearls a little bit. Um, 
I got a job working at a coffee shop from 4.30 in the morning to 11 in the morning and then went to class. And I had wow. the best time that year. That first year of law school was the most fun I think I have ever had in my whole life. New Orleans was great. Um, I discovered in the second semester that I love contracts, which is again, back to agreement, mediation, same, same. So oh, I contracts, I think are, I don't know, there's something beautiful about them. And then I discovered copyright law, intellectual property law, trademark law, entertainment law, which is awesome. And I just <laughs> I fell, I fell into contracts and I have other attorneys looking at me like, you are nuts. You know, that's like, yeah. that's like falling in love with dishes. You know, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> right. I do. And so um, at, out of law school, the you should stop me if I'm back to telling people. No, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. I'm enthralled and I know our listeners are too. So um, coming out of law school, I had um, I had a choice, actually. Um, my, my dad had finally stepped in and said, I'll introduce you to somebody and, and you can get a good job. I'm like, okay, what's that good job? And the good job was a good job. It was um, doing personal injury litigation with um, a FILA law firm, which is railroad, railroad injury law. And they're only oh, wow. really, there are three types of law that have no cap, like sky's the limit, whatever you can get the jury to give you. And one is maritime, which my dad did. The other is FILA, which is railroad. And the other involves blasting or anything ultra hazardous. So, wow. um, and it would have been a life of a lot of money, but looking at injuries all the time, I, I don't know, it just, like, like to me, when you're looking at a fork in the road and one of them is like, wah, wah, and the other one's like, ding, 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 ding. That's how clear it was to me. And the other option was to go in as into a dot com. Like this path is, is, is 200,000 out of the gate. This path uh -huh. is 36. Mm -hmm. You know where yeah. I went, right? <laughs> like the 36. 36, because it was in, it was in tech and the the whole world of copyright and that this was right at the edge of you know Napster was happening and the internet was booming and I ended up working as an in-house intellectual property uh, attorney for a startup that gathered up failing companies to bring them back into a, a place of usefulness or piece them out into other other places where they could do more good and from that I about a, a year two years later my law partner and I decided to hang our shingle. So we started our own law firm. Cool. Doing business startup, intellectual property contracts, 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. and mediation. And I've been a mediator since 2000. And I, what I realized in the process of all of this was that the basic misunderstandings that led to contractual disputes could have been averted. Like just understanding one another better you can stop that from ever happening. And so it's been kind of an inching back, like, oh, okay. So um, I started teaching people negotiation skills and networking skills because you get to know people, you calibrate right, you understand the contract, you negotiate it correctly, you will never end up in a dispute situation with a contract, hopefully, you know? Or, yeah. or it's less likely to happen by a lot. Right. And I, in the process of doing that, I realized, um, I would go to teach negotiation thinking like a, it, even at the upper management level, thinking that I would be teaching these upper, upper level NLP in negotiation techniques and the, the, mm -hmm. the nuances of it. Right. And right. I found out very quickly that I had to teach rapport skills first. And so mm. I, I went into several situations and, and just in my, in my um, analysis ahead of the job, you know, I survey people and find out where they are to figure out what, what they need to learn. It started with rapport. Most people weren't even taking the time to get rapport with one another before they jumped into a negotiation of a multi-million dollar contract. And this, like the first wow. company I did this work for was losing millions and millions and millions of dollars because people were blowing the contracts because they just had no fundamental understanding of how to connect. And so that's where that, like, okay. So I gotta teach rapport skills and now, I'm not even able to start with rapport skills. I have to go a little bit further back, which is who are you? How do you connect? Because 
what's happened is through a lot of soft skills training, people have been taught what they should do and how they should approach and how they, you know, how they're supposed to do it. And a lot of times that is absolutely incongruent with their own natural way of connecting. And so there are two things that happen there. One, they come off as inauthentic, even though they're trying. Mm -hmm. And they're not, mm -hmm. it's not that they are inauthentic, it's that they're just not being true to their own style. Right. And the other thing is it it builds a barrier right there because they're trying, they're trying. That's there, I'll leave it there. They're trying. And the thing is mm -hmm. with the cheaper people, I'm talking to you everybody watching and you, Kathy, <laughs> <laughs> there, we have, we have natural introverts and introverts are fine. And actually they're really good networkers because introverts go and they do the thing. Oh, I have to network. Fine. I'll do it. And they go and they do it. Shy achievers is what I'm calling them now who have been trained away from their natural way of connecting. They have another conversation going on in their heads. Am I doing this right? Why is he looking at me this way? Who should I talk to? And when I hear people say, oh, I hate networking, it's so exhausting. I know they, they mean it because networking is exhausting when you're an extrovert in a flow state doing it. When you're out there talking to somebody and you're, you're making a great connection and you're giving them the attention and, and the whole conversation, the care that it deserves, and then you, you, you tie it up with a nice bow, stop, lift off, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, and repeat that process over and over, it'll tire you out. But if you're doing that same thing and have a whole other conversation going back here. Oh my with, gosh, I can't with, even imagine. With the self-doubt and what are they saying? And oh my gosh, what are people gonna think about me? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that stage fright. Stage fright is, is when that other conversation eats up all of the working memory and you're standing up there and you have no resources to the thing that you rehearsed so well. And it happens wow. in these one-on-one -on -one interactions too. And knowing that, because I've been there, I was trained away from my natural way of connecting for a long time. I've had that other conversation going in my head. And when you quiet it, then your, your natural ability to connect can, can work for you. But if you're, if you're, if you are natural, like if you're naturally connecting purple, but somebody told you, you really need to be orange. It, it's just going to come off as mud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that analogy just popped into my head. So, um, this in that, that's where I am now. I have been working with high achievers and, and business people for a long time, just trying to help them create that support system, that network that, that has saved my life, not just, not just physically and in reality, but at, at every point of, of my, transformation when I left law and went into corporate training and then coaching, you know, when I produced, you know, wrote the books and put those out there, my network has always been like right here, always. And yeah. I could not have done any of it without that, that support. And you can't, you can't go as high. You can't reach as far when you don't have that. There's, a, there's a certain something to it. And if you, you know, if you have a high wire and a net underneath, likely is you'll, you'll make it across more readily than you would without one if you're new at it, you know? Yeah. We need that. We need that net. And that's what the network is. That's, you know, oh, I love that. <laughs> well, and I love that analogy. You need the net and the network is the net. Right. And I last year that. I had an analogy come to mind, which I love. And, and it's funny because you can look up times it worked and times it doesn't work on YouTube, but it's like, it's like the front row at a concert. If you're going to stage dive and everybody's seeing the pictures of somebody like, you know, flying off the stage into the crowd, right. you know, how fun, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's some videos out there where people just step aside and somebody smacks. Wow. Oh yeah. But, but if you think about it that way, if, if you have a, a very small group of people in your life that serve every purpose, you're landing on them for everything. You've got relationship problems. You've got work problems. You've got yeah. health problems. You're landing on that same group of people over and over. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to have enough people there that you can shuffle who's in that front row to suit whatever endeavor you are, you are going into. 
You, you mm-hmm. will want different people in the front row when you walk the Appalachian Trail or you're planning a big project like an outdoor thing than you would when you're starting up a tech business or getting a divorce or whatever. Like you want yeah. that front row populated with the right people who are not just willing to catch you, mm-hmm. but, but obviously people that you would be willing to catch if the roles were reversed. Yeah. That's, that is what wow. I'm I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's how I got here. So <laughs> that's such a fabulous story. Um, I'm. I just. I feel like I just was watching a Lifetime movie, <laughs> a good one. <laughs> it's kind of hard to like. Um, oh wait, I forgot the bar exam. I got to tell you this part too. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> when I got to the bar exam, um, and it's something people study like all day for. Um, Right about that time, I had a friend who's a, a visual artist named George Marks, who's a darling, um, called me and say, we're going, there a group of us, we're going up in the World Trade Market in Dallas. Do you want to put your photography up? And I said, yes, absolutely. And he said, okay, we're going to need 36 pieces <laughs> framed and ready to go. And I had a dark room in my house, but it wasn't light tight. It was only light tight at night. And those of you who've ever actually worked in a real dark room, you need it to be dark. And the bar review class was during the during the evenings, and um, I I could I was like I can't do both, and I was determined to do both, and so um, I called him and I harassed this guy so much that I think I caught him on his cell phone one day. He had to pull over, and he's like, "What do you want?" I'm like, "I want the tapes and the books, and I want you to give them to me at half price since I'm not going to the classes." And I, <laughs> he finally relented. <laughs> And so I was listening to cassette tapes in the dark room and studying the books during the day for about four or five hours a day. I slept 11 hours a day leading into the bar oh exam. My gosh. And it was 21 hours of handwritten essay, Louisiana bar exam with a 40, I think at the time a 43% pass rate. And I passed the first time I skipped a section. Woo-hoo! I didn't want to take it. <laughs> I sat in the uh, in the parking garage, the Superdome, eating peanut butter sandwiches. And when I got back into the test, the lady's like, "We don't have your exam from the last one." I'm like, "I didn't take it." And like, there was a the proctors were all you know older ladies, and they're all like, "Oh, <laughs> I'm like I'm fine, <laughs> don't you worry, thing." Um, and it worked out. So that's amazing. That's what Beyond Rainmaking is about. I wrote about that in a blog about the photo reading and, and I, this is the power of SEO for those of you who don't know the search engine optimization when you put the tags in your blog post, because uh-huh. I suddenly was just bombarded with these emails from law students. And I'm like, okay, this is really weird. Because I didn't remember putting bar exam in the tag. And it was uh-huh. after, like, well after that book was published, I went back in to update that post. And I was like, that's it. That's how they fit. <laughs> like, yeah. He's the theme. SEO, <laughs> like, holy cow, <laughs> who knew? But um, literally there, th- those emails and the prompting was what made me like, fine, I'll write it all down because I was answering these emails and they would send me back questions. I'm like, okay. And we're back and forth, like, I'll write an article. And the article yeah. turned into a book. And um, if, anybody, if anybody is interested in knowing how to get over a, a massive academic gap, that's it. That's a, that is the recipe for how I did it. It's everything that I learned in the in the time between 16 and 22 years old to get back into school and knock it out. And the things that I've learned since then that, that I wish I'd known back then, like emotional freedom technique, EFT, which I love. Um, but there are a lot of people right now who have kids who are going to be falling behind in a couple oh, yeah. of years. Well, not just, not just academically, and they will be, um, yeah. But also socially, and that's that's where I'm I'm out there preaching the the friendship because mom and dad are the ones who are going to have to show the kids how to do this. If they're not being if they're not able to socialize and play and get in fights and you know share toys and do all the things that little kids need to do to become socialized, mom and dad need to brush up on their skills so that they can pass them down now. Because it, I don't know how long we're going to be like this socially distanced, but in the formative years, this matters. And I, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, to bridge that academic gap and get a kid back up to speed. Cause I've done that. Let's say it was totally easy, but it, it's doable. I think socially would have been a little bit more difficult. 
So for all of you out there with kids who are not being socialized, that only child at home, you need to get you need to get on it and and learn and study on the, the social skills that you can teach your kids for sure. Do you have a suggestion for them on how to learn how to do that? Um, I'm about to teach class on it. I, I haven't set the dates yet, but I'll be doing a six week course on it, starting with starting with aligning with, with that style because everybody has one. It's like a fingerprint. You, me, everybody has a way of connecting that's normal and natural for them. When you build on that strength, you come off as normal and natural and not like you're stilted and trying trying to figure out somebody's disc assessment or Myers, Myers-Briggs type. Oh, I'm an entry. No. <laughs> yeah, because somebody might be an EN, ENTP on a Sunday and, and have, have a hangover and, and be acting a different way. You don't know. You have to be able to calibrate to people in the moment. And um, there are books out there on getting along with others. Uh, how to win friends and influence people. Hell, <laughs> you know, go straight to the source, Dale Carnegie. Yeah, that's like the original. It really is. And it's it's full of good stories too. And if you think about it, a lot of those, somebody should redo that book for kids, <laughs> actually. But there are probably some good children's books. And I, I always kind of go back to getting to yes, because it's a simple, short book about coming to agreement. And Ideally, if, if your children are equipped with nothing else, and never mind, it's great for everybody to know how to come to agreement. Don't you agree that it is time for us to have more understanding in the world? Yes, it is. That <laughs> able to teach kids how to, how to, how to negotiate on an interest, interest level. Like you're not negotiating about the thing, you're, you're negotiating with a person who has interests, who has needs who has anxieties about things, who has wants and desires, and you need to be able to figure that out. That is a great book for it. Getting to yes and, and then taking those principles and using them because it's not just about, you don't show them, you show them. You show them by doing it. And that's the thing. It's Friendship isn't something that people are taught in general. Like I've talked to people who've grown up on all sorts of teams and that kind of thing, and they do learn teamwork and that kind of thing. But most kids never have an opportunity to learn how to go say, hello, how do you break the ice? How do you, how do you keep the conversation going? What do you do when somebody gives you a, just a simple yes or no? How do you open that conversation back up? How do you, how do you get out of a corner when someone has close talked you into it? We learn this by trial by fire and to think how important it is. And on a like a statistically, uh, soft skills training has been shown to have a 256% return on investment. And my new fun question is, what would a 256% improvement in your social life look like? That'd be a fun time, I think. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, that's that that's like? awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you think about it, 70% of all jobs come through a connection. Uh, only 30% of jobs are ever actually posted for the public. Most things are filled with a friend of a friend of a friend. And a really good book that I'm reading right now is called A Friend of a Friend. And it's awesome. And it's about it's about understanding your network as a holistic thing and seeing it out to its very edges. And what's interesting is when when those opportunities and customers and clients and that kind of thing come in, it's usually not your core people. Like you've got your 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 super close knit group, you got this group, those opportunities come from these outer layers and they call them weak ties. And it's it's your brother's cousin's ex-roommate who remembers that you do X, Y, Z, who like, like did, 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 it sends it through the channels to get in touch. And I mean, I know you've had that happen. It's, I, I had. Yeah, I absolutely have. And, you know, I actually, without knowing what I was trying to teach, I've been trying to teach the people in my program exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Because they'll ask me a question like, how do I get into your inner circle? And I'm like, well, you show up whenever you have a chance to show up anywhere I am live, you show up, you speak yeah. up, you let me know you're there. I'm going to notice you. That's how do you, and get I'm going to care that? about you, you know, yeah. you're, you're the number one fan. You're in the front row all the time, all the time, all the time. They exactly. see like, Oh, she's back. 
you know, I have a friend who's, <laughs> she and I went to, um, well, actually she was in my barn group and she is, is now very good friends with all the members of, of a band called the Mavericks, which I love. And we saw them at jazz fest and she's just, and it's not like she's not a groupie or anything, but when they're in town or when they're nearby, they're like, Hey, let's go stay. And they've seen her face enough and she's memorable enough that, that they're like, Hey, Hey, you, <laughs> you know, come hang. And um, yeah, exactly. It, it's a matter of being present and interested and interesting. Yes. Because like uh, people will say, well, you just want me to pay to be in a program closer to you. And I'm like, no, I don't. That's not what you need to do. In fact, you won't even be invited to pay to be in a program closer to me. If I don't know who you are and get to know you and see all that is the amazing you. And I invite you to stuff and you don't show. Mm -hmm. I can't force you to do this. And it, it, it is really key that, that you do get to know them because if you have a, a, I know the word's overused right now, but a curated group and you are, you are shepherding these people into a better place, you do not want a bad apple. Like, or even a really different yeah, color. And that's exactly what a, I have. I have a curated group. I choose very carefully. You want the right fit people in there. And then, and then but the beauty of it is, and when you're in a group like that, where it is right fit, it has been properly curated. It does, it's so fun. It's so magic. It feels like family in a great way. <laughs> like, yay. These oh are yeah, favorite. exactly. And, and, and that's what I want. That's what I, why I curate. And that's, that's when you have people scrambling to show up and showing up without makeup on because they have to be there. It's more important for them to be there than to do something else. And that's, you know, they're there because it nourishes their soul and their business and, and serves as that accountability and it's a pillar. That's the right fit. That's when you have the right fit. Isn't it glorious? Oh yeah. It and is. I want everybody to have that experience because right now, especially, and I've, I've been a member of a group like that online since May, and it just blows me away um, how great it is. And I've, I've made some very good friends. You know, we're all, we're a little, little bud stage, like, like seeds were planted in May and they're, they're growing. You know, I've got a, I've got a bunch of them that are like, they're going to be trees. They're forever friends. It's like, and I met them online. We've never, we've never shared air together, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that we, it's time to get used to at least a hybrid method of crafting these friendships and not rely on, on having to do these things offline because, you know, it's not feasible. A, B, I think that we've all learned that we can have great interactions over vast distances and time zones and everything. And it's, it's not entirely necessary. You know, so do you have any tips that you can share with people who don't know how to naturally do this? Because, you know, they, they haven't had that social environment where they learned it naturally. Um, do you have any tips? Yes. A couple of them. Um, one is examine your, examine your best relationships, it, even if it's family and like get a notebook, go get your notebook and write down like. I, I think of who you enjoy spending time with. It's like, I enjoy spending time with Jenny because we laugh together or, you know, it, she, she makes me think hard about things or, um, you know, I always feel like I've had a big hug just talking to her on the phone, like whatever, how do you feel when you're around these people? And then how do you think you make them feel, or how do you try to make them feel? How, how do your good friends and your good relationships make you feel? And what are you actively doing to, to encourage and, and, um, and grow them to nourish those friendships? What are you doing? And look also at, at the best friendships you have or have had and think back, think back to the day you met. What was it? Like go back in time in your time machine and think about, what was the thing about so-and-so that really like, what, what about Jenny got your attention? What was, you know, was something funny? Where did you meet? What did you like immediately? Um, and, and look at how those relationships have grown. And then 
here's my best tip. It's the first of the year. I've been preaching this for months now and I'll preach it every day. If anybody will listen, it's this. You don't need a reason to call somebody or to touch base with somebody. In fact, it's better if you don't for a hundred thousand reasons. But if, I mean, I gave a recipe for asking for help a while back. Like I was working with somebody who would lost a job in a good, good industry and wanted, he was looking at doing something that was a side hustle. I'd been a side hustle for a while, you know, um, woodworking. And he's like, I, I don't want to, you know, I need to find a job. I need, I'm looking for something. I don't know how to approach my groups. I'm like, okay, how about this? You know, just start touching base with people with no agenda, none. You can send a text out that says, I saw, you know, I saw a tree today and I thought about you. I hope you're doing well. You know, I heard a song that reminded me of X, Y, Z. I hope you're doing well, you know, and leave it. They'll respond or they won't. But if they do, mm -hmm. then you open a dialogue. And the, the, mm -hmm. all you really want to know is how are they doing? Let them talk, call and listen. Yeah. And at the end of that yeah. conversation, you'll either know that it is not a good time to ask them for anything and you should offer some help or they'll turn and go, okay, hey, Kathy, I've been talking about myself this whole time. How are you? And that's an opening mm -hmm. to say, you know what? This whole thing has been a little crazy. And in the midst of it all, I've decided that I'm going to pursue a passion that I've had for some time. Would you happen to know someone in woodworking? Would you happen to know anybody who's done something like this before that I could talk to? Mm -hmm. Are you interested in buying this turned bowl that I made? You know, <clears throat> or I've, mm -hmm. I've started a Facebook group. I would love to have you in it. Just ask for the support that you need, but only after you have had that conversation, right. felt it out. And then you'll right. know if it's a good time or a bad time. And especially if you've had the opportunity to go over those great relationships Great, great relationships before it got me. You'll feel it viscerally. Is this a good time to ask for anything? Yes or no. If not, offer. How? What can I do for you? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Just the other day, um, I was feeling kind of bad because I hadn't uh, responded <clears throat> in a timely fashion to somebody that I really care about um, to talk with them because a million reasons. And I woke up thinking about them and I just texted him and said, I woke up thinking about you this morning and the beautiful time we had together in Santa Barbara. And I just wanted to let you know that, uh, I will always treasure that. And right away, you know, she responded back and, and was like, Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I feel the same way. And, you know, now we're cool again, instead of me just yeah. continuing to go, Oh, I never went, got back with her. She was probably mad at me now or something. Right. Right. And, and that's, that's that self-talk. Yeah. Yes. No more self-talk, <laughs> but, but that's all you have to do. And the thing is, especially for, for those of you who are out there building businesses and starting up and doing your things, you don't have mm -hmm. to take, it doesn't take much time. Mm -mm, it takes it doesn't. Like next to no time. And at this point, I mean, there is going to be a time where I'll have to have some other method for doing what I do, but I, I have a mental Rolodex. And when someone pops into my mind, immediately, I'll either write it down. If it happens twice, I'll pick up the phone and call. And it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you know, if, they're, if, they, if they pick up, yay. If they don't, I'll leave a quick message. Right. Yes, I'll still leave messages. Um, I think the voice, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the little microphone on your text message, you can actually leave a quick, hey, thinking about you yeah and that's right people who would never listen to voicemail will listen to your little text they sure will yeah um, yeah <laughs> i learned that one from whatsapp um but <laughs> you know a, a quick you know a picture a smile like you turn on you're like hey thinking of you take a picture of yourself take a picture of you yeah. put the dog there whatever just let them right. know they're on your radar that is it that is all you have to do i i remember mm -hmm. you you're important to me. You're important enough for me to stop at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday to, to ping you because you crossed my mind today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I also have people who have said, you know, oh, you just are a natural at chatting with people. How, how do you get like that? And I'm like, 
Well, here's what goes through my mind is I'm truly interested in people. So it's not like I have an agenda. I just am truly interested and curious. And so I just talk with them about, Hey, who are you and what you got going on? Because I want to know. The part of that is, is, um, is a lack of self-consciousness about it. And having been on the other side and been very self-conscious about things, it's, it's, that's being able to release the self-consciousness. And again, back to the flow state, I think that um, the flow state defined is losing a sense of self and being completely absorbed in the activity. And I think that mm. true extroverts get into a flow state when they're socializing. You know, oh, I definitely do. A true extrovert will, will take energy from, will build energy in a, in a social situation. And it's because they're in a flow state the ones who are the shy achievers are fighting the flow state. If you can imagine, they're swimming against the grain of their own ability to connect. The introverts can just go do it. It's Mm -hmm. it's just another thing for them. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like washing the car, like, oh, networking. Right. Do that too. it, so is what you're saying that, yes, they may be curious and they may be interested in what other people think, but they're too afraid to ask? Yeah. Ah, and there, there's a dialogue going on in the head that's the not good enough dialogue, the comparing dialogue. Because if, if you ask somebody, if you meet somebody new and they start talking about themselves and, you know, they've got a great life and they've got a beautiful wife and they've got, you know, a Jaguar outside or whatever, that voice uh-huh. is going to be bing, bing. <laughs> it's instead of you going wow that's awesome <laughs> yeah because that's what i would do i would be like wow what's it like to have that that's all that's cool what'd you do to get it <laughs> right well the self-consciousness and the not good enoughness and the in the the competitiveness that that is um instilled in some different you know it could be from school or church or mom or dad or whatever that that will say uh-uh you can't you can't compete here. You can't, you're not enough to stand with these people. You're, they're better than you and that kind of thing. That's, that's that dialogue. And I think the real key is to quiet that dialogue. And I do a lot of work with clients around that because it's, it is. Any quick tip. I know that's a longer, probably a longer conversation, but any quick tip on how to quiet that dialogue? Yes. Like a step one. Back to this. You get, get a notebook. For your, whatever social thing you're about to go do, even if, if it's a phone call, if, if it's something that, that you've avoided, picking up the phone or going to a networking thing or um, turning your camera on in Zoom, write a quick best case scenario. And that just, just having in mind what your end goal is, like at the end of this, I want to feel and make it subjective and about you, I want to feel like I have been a part of a conversation I, or, or um, like I've been adequately heard and understood and my ideal outcome is for X, Y, Z. Have it written down. And if you have that best case scenario, your ideal outcome written down, it does a lot to turn off the negative chirp in the head. It, it's like putting blinders on of, okay, now I know what I want. All these things that I don't want are not as visible to me anymore. And so that's, that mm. is my, my top one, know what you want out of, yeah. even if it's a, you know, conversation with your spouse, that's, that's tricky. What do you, what's the best case scenario is, you know, yeah. is the best case scenario winning or being right. Um, and if it's winning, which everybody always says, you know, do you want, do you want to win or do you want to be right? I want to win. Everybody says that my next question yeah. is always, what does winning mean for you here? What mm-hmm. would be a win? Is winning going mm-hmm. to bed with smiles on your faces tonight? Is mm-hmm. winning, is winning, you know, having having a concession made here or there? What is winning? Is winning feeling yeah. like you got a good deal? Or is winning watching yeah. somebody squirm? What is that? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, right? But yeah. it's a valid question. And it when you have mm-hmm. it in mind, it really does a lot to direct your mind into, okay, what is what is winning here? What would make me happy mm-hmm. tomorrow? What do I want to say to somebody about how this went down next week? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. 
I'm, if I'm, when, yeah. I'm, when I'm ahead of this and it's behind me, how do I want to describe it? How do I want to feel about this day later on? And that's when yeah. you get what winning is. That's when you can define winning. And if somebody who's yeah. in the shy achiever phase and they're scared to go into a networking thing, their best case scenario, their ideal outcome might be to simply leave having had a good time. You know, or, or you know what? It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> adjust that dial wherever it's comfortable for yeah. you and realistic for you it may not be realistic to go away going yeah i had a great time but it may be realistic <laughs> to say you know what i did a good job i feel like i did a good job connecting as good as i could yeah. be. or yeah. i did a better job connecting than i have in the past yeah that's i love that you know yeah i love that but having having a goal set in, at the beginning that is doable and reasonable and and it feels right, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be a lot easier to interact with other people because then you can give them and the conversation the attention it deserves, and that's it's yeah. really about presence and awareness and attention and validation and everybody wants to be heard, understood, and accepted. Mm -hmm. And the more you can make the people around you feel heard, understood, and accepted, the better. And the, the oh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't? Name one person. Right. Even Scrooge ended up wanting to <laughs> heard, understood, heard, understood, and accepted. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to ask you a question, but that's the answer to it. I was going to, what I was going to ask you is, you know, as like I call myself an extreme extrovert because I don't even, you know, I, I'm so out there. I am we should go airport embarrass people. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, you know, in the grocery line, I turn around and talk to people about what they have in their carts, total strangers. And totally, you know, some people look at me like, who the hell are you? Um, but you know, I really care about the shy, um, oh, achievers because that's who I work with a whole lot is shy achievers. And I care about helping them and not making them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you, you know, for somebody like me, how do I do that? And you answered it by, uh, you know, validating them, helping them be seen, heard and accepted. You create a safe space. And that's, that's when you have a, a right fit group, that's what that is. It's everybody, everybody circles the wagons. And in that space, in that group, they all feel safe and validated, understood and accepted. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it, that also tells me why, um, you know, I got, I had gotten a lot of um, feedback from people who aren't in my group, who aren't virtual assistants, um, who are coaches that I've worked with uh, in the past who have said, you know, you can't, the, the vast majority of people in your program are introverts. Um, and I love your shy achievers. That's such a great uh, thing to call them. You yeah. can't ask them to dance. You can't ask them to sing. You can't ask them to uh, wear costumes. They're too shy. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and they won't like it. And they won't become part of your program. And I'm like, I think they will like it because it's going to be fun. And guess what? They love it. Well, when you create that safe space, you give, that's what happens. What you're seeing is what happens when, is when the shy achiever shuts off that self-talk and they feel comfortable enough. And, and when I hear, oh, somebody's shy, but when, once you get to know them, oh yeah, that's a shy achiever because right. that's, that's when they feel safe enough to be themselves. And yes. what you're creating is a place that's safe enough for them to be themselves. And yeah. It's a matter, it's a matter of allowing that self-consciousness to drop away. And that's what you do. Yeah. And uh, that there's no bigger gift than that. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, we did a, um, uh, I feel like one of my greatest, greatest achievements is our October virtual event. We did a, um, talent contest. And again, everybody said, no one wants to participate in a talent contest especially not introverts. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know my group. We're going to have a blast. Oh my gosh, Nancy, you, I, I literally was in tears most of the night because they were singing. They were playing the piano. They were playing bagpipes. They were painting. I mean, it just went on and on and on. It was Heard, amazing. Understood, accepted. Yeah. 
It was and amazing. That, I actually have um, a, a psychiatrist who's going to be on the podcast soon talking with me about the differentiation between true introverts and shy achievers. Because oh, I want to hear that one. That sounds yeah, really interesting. I'm, I'm excited. Um, but the, the thing is, and especially with the whole pandemic and the lockdowns and the shut ins and that kind of thing, the true introverts are like, Meh, okay. <laughs> and, and the oh, extrovert- they're happy. <laughs> yeah. And the extroverts are like, are, the true extroverts have found avenues out like you and I have, but the shy achievers That's right. are the ones who are suffering. Oh, wow. That's so they, interesting. They've, they've, they've taken some pill that somebody gave them that said, you're an extrovert because, but they're not, you're not really. They're, they're maybe an ambivert or an introvert or an extrovert who's been trained away from their natural communication abilities. And that, that uh-huh. really is, I can't express that more powerfully. There's so many people out there who would be, who would be really good, solid, beautiful, natural connectors who have been, had it bullied out, beaten out, trained out, unlearned somehow, oh, teased out, but it's true. And you know them, I know them. They're those super gifted people who one-on-one are just a, a barrel of monkeys when they're comfortable and happy, but you put them in a crowd and they're mm-hmm. like, they freak out. <laughs> <laughs> that was a face, yeah. huh? <laughs> Well, um, I could absolutely talk with you all day long. This has I- been amazing. <laughs> I feel so honored that you shared your story with us, Nancy. That was a blessing for well, us I- all to hear. Hopefully getting better at telling it. I know I leave some things. Oh, that was really good. <laughs> but that's you and the I don't think you need to improve any over what you just did. <laughs> and yeah, thanks so much for sharing all your tips with us. So for those people who are listening and are like, I need more Nancy. Um, what kind of people do you like to work with? Tell us a little bit about that and then how they can learn more from you. I really like working with... Um, people who are in in the sciences and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and they're the people who have had their, those achievers, they put their nose down in academia and then in the career and then in the family and they get to a point. And it's, it's funny because they can, you can do a lot of hacks and it'll work for a long time, but there's a point, there's a point in, in the progress and the, and the advancement in career where the, the old hacks don't work anymore. And you need to learn how to connect like a ninja. And that's where I come in. So I like to work with these achievers who have, who have maxed out their ability to, to piecemeal those networks together. And they're ready to have a network that is truly supportive and meaningful and long lasting. And that's, that's not just friends, which are incredibly important. Don't even, you know, I could throw statistics all day long about that, but they make you happier, healthier, wealthier, smarter, and longer lived. Um, and that's mm-hmm. science. There's tons of it on that, mm-hmm. but also those professional networks that last because, you know, if you think about it, you don't want somebody who's around for a month or a year. You want to forge those professional networks that are, you know, decades long lasting ones that, that grow and, and bring in more of the right fit network partners for you. So okay. That's, that's who I like to work with. You can find, you can find the friends on hand podcast at friendsonhand.com, And you can find me at Nancy Tilton And, um, I, I love meeting new people and there you go. That's, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I have a group. Oh, I have a Facebook group. Nancy, friends thank on, you. Friends on hand oh, Facebook yeah. group. And I do go give on. a lot of goodies away there and I go live in there and talk about, um, nuggets of information that I've worked on during the week and I'll, I'll teach a little something, something every week. So that's a good place to come in too. If you want to join the group, come on. It's fun. Yeah. Hey, uh, more Nancy is what I need. And um, every time I say more, something like that, I think about more cowbell from SNL. Yes. <laughs> I love that skit. Well, it is more been- Nancy. I- we need more Nancy. <laughs> I love talking with you and, and I think we could probably talk for another three or four hours and shoot, we didn't even talk. Oh, about absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so Nancy, thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing all your insights. The links to all of the resources that you shared will be in the show notes. So if anybody wants to go there and just click, they can. And um, you're going to love working with Nancy and getting to know her better. I can tell you, I surely have. Thank you, Nancy.
Likewise. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There, you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.